So chapter 43 is our final chapter in Bio 170. So we've made it, or we've almost made it. Um, we're going to talk about biodiversity, conservation, and sustainability. Currently, there's 1.8 million species that are named and described according to our textbook, and the estimates of the number of undescribed species is pretty broad. It ranges from 5 to 100 million. I always think about, like, when I was a cashier, if I was off by that much, I would be in big trouble. But the reason this estimate is so broad is because there's just so many places that even if we've been there, we don't know how many species are there. Um, we don't know the number of microorganisms that are normally found in humans. There's a huge variation there between individuals. So how would we know the number of microorganisms found, you know, in a hippopotamus gut and things like that. Um, also, there's places that are hard to explore, like the, um, you know, really deep in the ocean is not easy to get to. So our estimates for the number of species total is pretty variable. The tropics have some of the greatest concentrations of species, but tropical habitats are being rapidly destroyed, and many unique species have been pushed to the brink of extinction due to human activities. And the current extinction rate is 100 to 1,000 times the background or typical rate that's seen in the fossil record. And there's some thoughts that we're maybe either in or entering another mass extinction event. So extinction itself isn't an unnatural thing, but the current rate of extinction being higher is um, the problem. So to deal with this threat of extinction and the loss of many species, conservation biology has emerged, and conservation biology really links several different fields in order to try and conserve biodiversity. So conservation biology includes ecology, physiology, molecular biology, genetics, and evolutionary biology. Our book includes three levels of biodiversity, and you know, if you look at a different textbook, they might break this up a different way, but overall, it's really saying the same thing. So our book talks about genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. So genetic diversity is the genetic variation within a population and between populations. So they've got a little picture of a vole population up there for you. Species diversity is the number of species in an ecosystem or across the biosphere. So there's a little coastal redwood ecosystem there. And I mean, they got a slug, they got a frog, they got some kind of mammal, they got um, fungus, they got trees, they got herbaceous plants, all kinds of things there showing you species diversity. Then you've got ecosystem diversity, which is the variety of ecosystems in the biosphere. So you've got diversity in ecosystems themselves. Um, this picture is showing you, you know, um, a marine ecosystem and you've got the coastline, you've got um, more open areas, you've got more wooded areas and, and so on and so forth there. So genetic diversity is pretty straightforward. This is the genetic variation within a population and between populations. If we have populations that go extinct, even if the species is still around, this reduces the genetic diversity of the species, which makes it so that the species has less genetic variation that may be useful um, in order to adapt to a changing environment. Species diversity, again, I think this one's pretty straightforward. Um, species diversity is the differences in, you know, the number of species in an ecosystem or across the biosphere. You've probably heard of endangered or threatened species before. An endangered species is in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or much of its range, whereas a threatened species, this is like a little bit less severe. It's likely to become endangered in the near future. Um, and at least 123 freshwater animal species have become extinct since 1900, and hundreds more are threatened. A local extinction refers to the loss of a species only in a particular geographic region, whereas the global extinction means the species is lost from all ecosystems that it lived in. So if you lose one species, um, that can have a big impact on other species in that ecosystem. For example, um, flying foxes, which are bats basically, not even basically, they are bats. Um, they're an important pollinator and seed disperser in the Pacific Islands. So if a plant loses its seed disperser and pollinator, um, if it doesn't have any other pollinators or seed dispersers, it's going to be in big trouble as well. 
if you want to kind of know more about this, there's actually places you can look this up because it's constantly changing. Um, so there's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, and they have a red list that shows you threatened and endangered species. And according to them, 12% of known bird species and 21% of known mammals are threatened. Um, plants matter too. So there's the Center for Plant Conservation um, at safeplants.org, and they indicate that 200 of 20,000 known plant species in the United States have become extinct and 730 are endangered or threatened. Ecosystem diversity is just the variety of ecosystems in the biosphere, and um, this is pretty obvious and we're going to get into it more, but human activity is reducing ecosystem diversity. For example, more than 50% of wetlands in the contiguous United States have been drained and converted um, to agricultural or other uses. Um, I am from Nebraska originally, and you know Nebraska has lots of cropland. It's not just all cropland, but it has a lot of cropland now, um, and originally most of that or much of that was wetland. And those wetlands are very fertile, so they make for gr growing crops very well, um, but it really reduces ecosystem diversity. So this is a preview instead of a review because this whole chapter is going to talk basically about why biodiversity is important and how we can protect it. And I think a lot of you are in this class because you value biodiversity in some way or another. You just maybe haven't thought about it in these terms before. So biodiversity is just the diversity of life. Um, and like I said, we're going to go over some specific things on why this is important. But typically, students will tell me things like, um, you know, food is a good one, right? You want to eat more than just one thing, although maybe right now you're eating a lot of the same thing. But generally, food is a good example of why biodiversity is important. Um, you know, medicinal uses is another good example that people sometimes come up with. You know, just like you like to go outside, you like to experience nature, um, you want to have nature for your kids or your grandkids or whatever, those are all reasons biodiversity is important. So just because it's not listed in our textbook doesn't mean it's not, you know, an important reason to have or maintain or protect biodiversity. So it's worth kind of thinking about. Um, so there you go. But we're going to go with our official list here coming up. So our book officially says that, um, you know, there's moral and philosophical reasons to care about the loss of biodiversity. We have our sense of connection to nature. Um, other species should be entitled to live. And then there's that concern for future generations. Um, species and genetic diversity also have many practical benefits like food and agriculture or medicinal or even um, genes that code for useful proteins and ecosystem services. When species are related to agricultural crops, um, they can have important genetic qualities that we may be able to tap into. For example, plant breeders bred virus resistant um, commercial rice by crossing it with a wild rice population. Um, there's also useful genes that are stored in living things. And if we lose a species, we lose all the genes that are in that species. and that species may have genes that code for proteins that we could find useful. Um, for example, DNA from many species of prokaryotic organisms is used in the mass production of proteins for medicine, food, petroleum substitutes, industrial chemicals, and other products. Medicinal use of biodiversity is another big one. I think a lot of times people think like, oh, we can just solve all these problems with some clever chemistry. Um, but really, most drugs are found in nature, and then the clever chemistry part comes when we try and synthesize it. But we really aren't doing clever chemistry to create drugs. In the United States, 25% of prescriptions came from substances originally derived from plants. A big or a good example of this is the rosy periwinkle, which is pictured over here to the right. That contains alkaloids that inhibit cancer growth, and the survival rate for childhood leukemia went from 10% to 90% after this drug was introduced. Um, also, antibiotics are derived from bacteria or fungi frequently. Bacteria or fungi in the soil are in competition with, the, with each other, and if they can release compounds that kill their competitors, then they are more likely to survive. So we can get antibiotics from them. And um, culturing soil bacteria is actually kind of tricky, and we're getting more and more techniques to do that. Um, and you know, the more bacteria we can culture in the lab and grow, then the more antibiotics potentially we could find. Um, 
also ecosystems provide services themselves. So an ecosystem service is um, the processes through which natural ecosystems help sustain human life. Some examples of ecosystem services include purification of air and water, um, detoxification and decomposition of waste, crop pollination, pest control, and soil preservation. And ecosystem services have an estimated value of uh, $33 trillion per year, but they're provided for free. Um, so up here on the top, there's an overgrazed area, and so there's not enough um, plant life to really keep the soil in place there. Um, and so if you had a large amount of water go over that soil, you would get a lot of particulates. But then in the picture below, there's um, kind of a schematic of a floating wetland, um, but a, a natural wetland would do the same thing. You can see the water going in is very turbid and the roots of the plants um, absorb the soil particles and the nutrients in that water and the water coming out is much more clear. So let's talk about the threats to biodiversity. Um, most species losses can be traced to four major threats. Um, I know that the graph on the other side has more than that, but uh, that graph's from a different book. But the four major threats our book talks about are habitat loss, introduced species, overharvesting, and global change. Um, in this graph from a different book, they've got the top threat as habitat loss. So we're going to say for now, top threat is habitat loss. I also think it's really easy when we're in this chapter to get in um, to talking about like, how did all those people cut down all the forest or how do they not care about, you know, living things and things like that. But we have to be very careful on that because, um, you know, we're all sitting in habitat loss as we go over this PowerPoint together. So be careful that you're not, um, too judgmental and placing the blame for these environmental issues on other people because um, we're all kind of part of the problem, but we can all be kind of part of the solution. And any solution that is going to be effective needs to include people. So like we said, habitat loss is the greatest threat to biodiversity throughout the biosphere. This results from things like agriculture, urban development, forestry, mining, and then um, you can pollute a habitat so much that it's not functional as well. So. I picked pictures specifically from North America because I think it's easy, again, for people to think about habitat loss and tropical rainforests and things like that. Not to say it doesn't happen, but we have habitat loss here as well. So the first picture is uh, clear cut along Oregon's coast, and the second picture is um, patches, which um, the fragmented habitats harbor a smaller population, which has a higher probability of local extinction. But if we have kind of patches um, th that avoid clear cutting, that can be beneficial for our organisms compared to just straight clear cutting. Introduced species, um, lots of you did your projects on an introduced species. Those are species that humans have moved from um, one region to a new region, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Lots of times species get introduced accidentally because, you know, they're in cargo or they're in the ballast water of ships. And, you know, in some cases, though, humans have deliberately introduced some species. Um, they maybe have good intentions, but it can still have disastrous effects. Um, introduced species may spread very quickly because they don't have native predators or native parasites um, or pathogens. And these introduced species may really disrupt their adopted community through either predation or competition. So introduced species have contributed to about 40% of worldwide extinctions recorded since 1750. So kudzu is a good example of a species that was intentionally introduced that has gone out of control. So it was intentionally introduced to control soil erosion. And I mean, I guess it's doing a good job of that because it grows super fast and so there's not a lot of bare soil that's being eroded away. However, you can see that truck is just like covered in it. Um, kudzu grows so rapidly and so aggressively, it's outcompeting native ve vegetation, it climbs up trees and um, outcompetes them for light, things like that. So. You have to be super careful if you're introducing one species in to try and solve a problem. Over harvesting is taking wild organisms at rates that exceed the ability of their populations to rebound. So species with restricted habitats or large body sizes or low reproductive rates are particularly sensitive to over harvesting. 
Um, for example, African elephant populations have only stabilized um, when they've been protected by hunting for nearly a century. So these big, um, rare species are at kind of a higher risk. Um, besides just their low reproductive rate, um, if you're rare, you become more valuable and then you um, have people who are further incentivized to hunt them. So it's kind of a problem there, obviously. Um, so DNA analysis can help conservation biologists find the source of illegally obtained animal products and then um, work to protect that particular population. So an example of that DNA um, helping understand which populations are at risk, um, DNA from illegally harvested ivory can be used to trace um, where the population of elephants that ivory came from to a few hundred kilometers, and so you can put um, more effort at protecting those particular populations. Overharvesting is a big deal for fish populations as well. The North Atlantic bluefin tuna is a big fish. I think people think tuna is like a small fish because it comes in a small can at the store, right? But that's that's not how it actually is. They're a pretty big fish. Um, so their population has decreased significantly um, in the last 10 years. Another threat to biodiversity is global change. Global change includes alterations in climate, atmosphere chemistry, and broad ecological systems. So acid precipitation is a type of global change. Burning wood and fossil fuels causes sulfuric and nitric acid to form in the atmosphere, and this causes acid precipitation. And acid precipitation is harmful to many organisms. Um, organisms have a certain pH that they need to live within. Um, when I was a kid, I, I thought like, oh, we're gonna have acid rain and it's gonna melt my skin off and things like that. And that's not so much what we're saying here. Um, however, if the low pH of acidic precipitation can alter soil chemistry, it can affect cation exchange, um, and obviously if the pH is low enough, it can um, like directly damage organisms as it falls, but that's not so much what we're talking about. Um, environmental regulations have helped decrease acid precipitation. For example, um, sulfur dioxide emissions in the United States have decreased by 40% between 1993 and 2009. Greenhouse gases and climate change are, I think, something people are largely familiar with now. So deforestation and burning fossil fuels contributes to global carbon dioxide emissions. If we think about deforestation, um, if we had the forest intact, it would be able to capture that carbon. However, when you remove a forest and then burn that forest, it's like a double whammy because you're taking away the thing that could capture the carbon dioxide. And then when you burn it, you're also releasing the carbon dioxide from that. Um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration has increased by more than 45% in the past half century, and changing concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide are correlated with climate change, which is a directional change to the global climate that lasts for 30 years or more. Um, and wind and precipitation patterns and the frequency of extreme weather events are also changing with the warming of the planet. I feel like people have seen this graph a lot of times or a graph very similar to this. Um, on the left hand side, you've got concentration of carbon dioxide in parts per million. On the right hand side, um, with the red line, you've got average global temperature in degrees Celsius, and then you've got the year, and you can see there's a pretty good correlation between um, carbon dioxide concentration increasing and um, average global temperature increasing as well. So I think the greenhouse effect is something that's maybe a little bit um, misunderstood. So we do need the greenhouse effect to keep Earth's surface at a habitable temperature. So what happens is solar radiation um, strikes Earth's surface and most of that incoming radiation is absorbed, which warms the surface of the Earth. And then some of the absorbed radiation is emitted from the Earth as heat. And then much of that heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases and then radiated back towards Earth. So that helps um, war warm the surface of the Earth. However, when we have a thicker layer because we have extra carbon dioxide and water vapor and other greenhouse gases, um, that is, like putting a thicker blanket around the earth and if you have too thick of a blanket right you're going to be too hot um, so rising concentrations of greenhouse gases is linked to increasing global temperatures
So we talked about biodiversity and what it is and the threats to biodiversity. So now we're going to kind of talk a little bit about like, what do we do to keep it around? So there's different ways you can do this. Population conservation focuses on population size, genetic diversity, and critical habitat. So biologists that focus on conservation at the population and species level follow two main approaches. They have either the small population approach or the declining population approach. The small population approach studies processes that can make small populations become extinct, and the declining population approach looks at threatened and endangered populations that show a downward trend regardless of their current size. This is looking at the environmental factors that cause the population to decline. Small populations are prone to inbreeding and genetic drift. Um, if you recall from Bio 160, Genetic drift is when we have um, evolution, so the change in proportion of alleles in a population due to random chance alone. And when you have inbreeding and genetic drift, that can draw the small population into an extinction vortex. Um, so the key factor that drives the extinction vortex is the loss of genetic variation necessary to enable evolutionary responses to that environmental change. Small populations and low genetic diversity um, do not always lead to extinction, but they make extinction more likely. This slide shows an extinction vortex. So if you have a small population, and then that leads to inbreeding and genetic drift. So now you have loss of genetic variability, and then you have lower individual fitness and lower ability for the population to adapt to changing environments. That leads to lower reproduction rates and higher mortality rates, which gives you a smaller population. And they call it a vortex because it's like when you flush the toilet, right? And the water just spins out of it. So small populations lead to smaller populations, which which lead to smaller populations, which lead to smaller populations until you get all the way down to the vortex and you have um, no population left. The greater prairie chicken is an example of the extinction vortex and also an example of a successful um, kind of correction of that. So North American populations of greater prairie chickens were fragmented by agriculture in the 1900s. So this gave us small populations. And there was a huge population decline in Illinois that was associated with decreased fertility. And what scientists did to try and rectify this, which actually worked out well, was they transplanted birds from larger populations. And that allowed the declining population to rebound, which confirmed that there was low genetic variation um, that caused an extinction vortex. If we look at the graphs, the top graph is showing you population dynamics with the number of male birds, and then the bottom graph is showing you hatching rate. You can see in the early 90s, there were not very many male birds in this particular population, and the percentage of eggs hatched was very low. But when they translocated the new birds into the population, obviously the number of males went up because there's new birds added, right? Um, but also, um, the percentage of eggs hatched went up, which means the population itself increased in size as well. So how small of a population is too small? Well, you have a minimum viable population, which is the minimum population size at which a species can survive. And this depends on factors that affect a population's chances for survival over a particular time. And a meaningful estimate of this requires determining the effective population size, which is based on the population's breeding potential. If we look at the grizzly bear, this is a good example of an effective population. So a population of 70 to 90 bears would have a 95% chance of surviving for 100 years or 200 years if the starting population was increased to 100 bears. The Yellowstone grizzly population is estimated to include about 500 individuals, but the effective population size is only about 125 because not everybody is reproducing. This Grizzly population has low genetic variability compared with other grizzly populations, so introducing individuals from other populations would increase the numbers and genetic vari variation. Um, promoting dispersal between fragmented populations is an urgent conservation need because that's going to make our population um, able to interbreed with other populations and give us more genetic diversity. So the other approach to conservation on the population level is the declining population approach. This looks at threatened and endangered populations that show a downward trend regardless of their current population size. And with this type of approach, the emphasis is on the environmental factors that are going to cause the population to decline. And if we can do anything to correct that, we can potentially save this population. 
A case study that shows the declining population is looking at the red cocked woodpecker. Um, this bird required living in trees and mature pine forests with little undergrowth. However, logging and agriculture and fire suppression have caused population declines by reducing suitable habitat. If you look at the pictures on the bottom of the slide here, um, A is a forest with low undergrowth. That is this bird's preferred habitat. And B is what happens when you have fire suppression. Um, you tend to have these um, more densely populated understories with lots of woody plants and less um, grasses and um, herbaceous plants down there. So to help these birds out, um, they have created um, human constructed nest cavities. The woodpeckers have to typically take months to excavate a new nest cavity. However, conservationists um, created nest cavities for them. You can see there's like a PVC pipe in that tree um, if you take a look at that picture. Um, so conservationists used a combination of habitat maintenance, um, so things like um, bringing fire back when appropriate, and then excavation of nesting cavities to enable the recovery of this species. So if we looked at why the population was declining and did some things to fix it, um, that helps preserve this particular species. Like we said before, conservation is sometimes tricky or often tricky because you need to deal with the human side of the problem as well. Um, so conserving species often requires resolving conflicts between the habitat needs of the species themselves and also the humans. For example, in the western United States, habitat preservation for many species is at odds with grazing and resource extraction industries. So in order for conservation to work, you have to get a human buy-in as well. Um, the ecological role of the target species is an important consideration for conservation. Conservation efforts today seek to sustain the biodiversity of an entire community, ecosystem, or landscape. Um, the structure of the landscape can strongly influence biodiversity, and many species use more than one type of ecosystem or live in the border between two ecosystems. So edges between ecosystems are actually defining features of a landscape. The abiotic conditions, so the non-living conditions in the edge are distinct from those in the surrounding landscapes. And some species are known to take advantage of edge communities to access resources from both adjacent areas. If you think of personal experiences with this, um, if you've ever been anywhere where there's a fence, like maybe your backyard or just anywhere where there's a fence, that ecosystem or that area is different than everything around it. You know, maybe it's harder to mow around the fence, so there's species that you're gonna find on the fence line that you wouldn't find other places. Maybe a bird sits on the fence and poops, so there's more nutrients available, right? So edges are, are different than the landscapes around them. Fragmentation increases edge habitat and reduces overall biodiversity, um, although edge adaptive species are probably going to increase in this case. So landscapes that are dominated by small fragments are going to actually support fewer species. So to connect habitat fragments, sometimes movement corridors are created. This is a narrow strip of habitat that connects otherwise isolated patches. This promotes the dispersal of species and helps to reduce inbreeding. And it can also promote the spread of disease, which is um, obviously not a good thing if all the organisms are going on, you know, one little movement corridor. Um, but generally it's a useful thing. Artificial corridors can be constructed in areas of heavy human use, as pictured there. Um, we can also establish protected areas. About 7% of the world's land has been protected in various forms of reserves, and the design, placement, and management of protected areas are controversial topics in conservation biology. So one thing people do is preserve biodiversity hotspots. A biodiversity hotspot is a relatively small area with a great concentration of endemic species and many endangered and threatened species. Hotspots make up only 2% of land area but provide habitat for nearly 30% of all bird species. The drawback of using hotspots as um, the only place we should put nature reserves or using hotspots as nature reserves are that it can be difficult to identify a hotspot and their designation is often biased towards saving vertebrates and plants. Um, you know, vertebrates are, people like vertebrates. Um, so maybe it's not the best place to save, but that's what people like and people are putting their money towards it and their effort towards it. 
The hotspot strategy also places a lot of emphasis on a very small fraction of the Earth's surfaces and the climate conditions that are currently favorable to a particular community in a particular hotspot could be different in the future. So I'm not gonna like give you a map and have you like shade in the hotspots, but here's just an example of Earth's terrestrial and marine biodiversity hotspots. So there's really no right answer necessarily, or it's at least a hotly debated subject when it comes to building nature reserves, but nature reserves are biodiversity islands in a sea of habitat that's altered or degraded by human activity. And it's important to consider disturbances as a functional component of all ecosystems. So if an ecosystem had you know, fire in its history, then it's important to include that in your reserve design as well. Um, so is it better to have many small reserves or a few large reserves? Uh, that's a great question, right? <laughs> um, smaller reserves may slow the spread of disease between populations, but may not support the minimal viable population size. Um, larger reserves provide more habitat for far-ranging animals with low density populations and have smaller perimeters, so fewer edge effects. Um, but acquiring a large amount of land and controlling that is resource intense. So zone reserves include um, relatively undisturbed areas that are surrounded by human modified areas of economic value. And a buffer zone is an area created by regulating human activities in the area surrounding the protected core. Um, the United States has adopted a zone reserve system with the Florida Keys, um, which has been going pretty well. So this little infographic isn't from our book, it's from a paper, um, but it does a good job showing you kind of the decisions you have to make when you're thinking about reserves. So if you are choosing between a large reserve or a small reserve, generally speaking, large reserves are better than smaller reserves. If you're choosing between um, one large or several small, it's better to get the one big one. If you're choosing between you know, four small that are close together or four small that are further apart, it's better to get the four small that are closer together. If you can choose um, between connected or unconnected, it would be best to choose connected. Um, as far as shape goes, compact sizes are best for minimizing um, edge effects and boundary length. However, you know, it's not always possible to get the exact shape that you want, right? Um, and then buffered zones are better than areas that don't have a buffered zone. So Earth is changing rapidly as a result of human actions. The locations of reserves today might be unsuitable for their species in the future. And there's three types of environmental change that threaten biodiversity. And this includes nutrient enrichment, accumulation of toxins, and climate change, which we discussed earlier. Humans definitely change Earth by um, moving nutrients around. We transport nutrients from one part of the biosphere to another. Agricultural soils become nutrient depleted as we grow crops and um, the nutrients from those soils are removed when those crops are removed. And fertilizers are then going to be used to replace nitrogen and other nutrients lost from the soil. So human activities have more than doubled the supply of fixed nitrogen available to primary producers. The critical load is the amount of added nutrient that can be absorbed by plants without damaging ecosystem integrity, and nutrients that exceed the critical load can leach into groundwater or run off into aquatic ecosystems, and then that can cause a phytoplankton bloom to occur. So that's that whole cultural eutrophication phenomenon where you have an algal bloom or a phytoplankton bloom and then those algae decompose and then that depletes dissolved oxygen levels and so then that kills organisms requ that require oxygen and so that results in aquatic dead zones. Humans release toxins into the environment and, you know, some people will say things like, oh, it's just a little bit or like dilution's a solution to pollution, but really it's not because some toxins can be concentrated at higher trophic levels if organisms can't metabolize or excrete those toxins. So PCBs and DDT are good examples of biological magnification. I mean, not good, like good for the environment, but good examples of this in play. Um, and herring gulls, PCBs concentrated um, and they had eggs that had 5,000 times um, 
the PCBs as the phytoplankton at the base of the food web. If we think about this, it's because um, zooplankton eat phytoplankton. It takes a lot of phytoplankton to run the zooplankton. Then small fish eat the zooplankton, and then bigger fish eat them, and then the herring gall eats a lot of um, those bigger fish, and so that toxin concentrates up at higher trophic levels. Another example of this is DDT. Um, DDT was banned in 1971, and so bird populations, um, it was a problem for them because they were having brittle shells. It's very hard to hatch your young if your shells are brittle because the shells are easily damaged, and then obviously the offspring inside those shells is not going to survive if they're damaged. Um, However, once DDT was banned, many of those populations, including the bald eagle, recovered. Another example of toxins in the environment is pharmaceutical drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs enter freshwater ecosystems through human and animal waste, and chronic exposure to low concentrations of sex steroids can have huge effects on aquatic species. For example, the estrogen that's used in birth control pills causes feminization of male fathead minnows. And if you look there um, on the pictures, A is a normal male, um, C is a normal female, and B is a male that was exposed to female hormones and prescription drugs and looks a lot more like a female than a male. So, you know, people don't necessarily do the correct thing with their pharmaceutical drugs. They just dump them down the toilet. Don't do that. Our waste treatment system does not have a way to pull pharmaceuticals out of um, the waste stream. It has ways to get rid of nutrients. It has ways to get rid of harmful bacteria, but it does not have ways to pull pharmaceutical drugs out of the wastewater treatment path. And Oftentimes what happens is those biosolids in wastewater treatment are um, collected and then used for fertilization. So we're just kind of compounding things with that. So here's the picture that's showing you um, somebody dumping their pills down the toilet. Don't do that. Um, showing you that it goes to the sewage treatment plant, but that the sewage treatment plant does not have a way to get rid of that. So now it's in the lakes and rivers. Um, that sludge is taken to farms to use as fertilizer. Also for giving pharmaceuticals to farm animals, um, you can have agricultural runoff, um, and that can also um, get those pharmaceuticals into the aquatic ecosystems. So don't dump your drugs down the toilet, prescription or otherwise. Climate change, we've already talked about how it happens, but then here's what happens to the organisms. Some organisms can expand to new ranges, so range expansions can occur, and these organisms expanding their range could harm other resident organisms. And it's not just like, like oh, everybody will move to an area that better suits them now. Because not all organisms are able to disperse rapidly enough to survive climate change. Also, climate change has already occurred and has already had wide-ranging effects on ecosystems worldwide. And the direct effects of climate change can cause cascading indirect biological changes that are really pretty difficult to predict. So if we look at kind of this cascading effect, um, if we look at pine trees, pine trees um, produce rest less resin when they are stressed by drought. Rising temperatures have also shortened how long it takes beetles to mature and reproduce, and so that leads us to um, more destruction due to pine beetles. You can see the orange um, and red trees there in that picture. Those are all trees that have been affected by pine beetles. If we look at the effect on individual organisms, um, American pikas spend more time in their burrow to escape um, heat and less time foraging for food. So if we look at the graph over here as mean summer temperature on the x-axis and um, area of habitat on the y-axis, and you can see that you have most pika extinctions occurring at sites with high summer temperatures and a small habitat area. If we look at effects of um, climate change on populations, caribou populations migrate north in the spring to give birth and to eat sprouting plants. Um, the alpine chickweed is an early flowering plant um, which caribou depend on. And if we look at the graph over here, you've got um, the day of the year of calving. That calving starts with the blue line and the red line is the day of the year that plant growth begins. And you can see that the earlier spring plant growth has resulted in food shortages and a drop in caribou offspring production. If we look at the effect on communities and ecosystems, um, 
The sea urchin requires water temperatures above 12 degrees Celsius to reproduce successfully, um, but sea urchins, as they expand their range, are destroying high diversity kelp communities, leaving urchin barrens in their wake. Global warming can be slowed by reducing energy consumption and converting to renewable energy, but stabilizing carbon dioxide emissions will require international effort and changes in personal lifestyle and industrial processes. And reduced deforestation would also de decrease greenhouse gas emissions because those intact forest ecosystems can actually capture carbon in their vegetation and in their soil. So let's review then. Um, it's recommended that pregnant women and women trying to become pregnant should not eat swordfish, which is a large, large predatory fish due to high levels of mercury. This is an example of what? Like the fish having high levels of mercury. That is biological magnification. So the human population is no longer growing exponentially. Um, and you know our book has it as still increasing rapidly, although current conditions might be changing that to some degree. Um, but the global environmental problems arise from growing human consumption and um, an increasing human population. Um, human population increased relatively slowly until about 1650, and then it began to grow exponentially. No population can grow indefinitely, and humans are no exception to this. The human population is now more than 7.2 billion people and it's predicted to increase to 8.1 to 10.6 billion by 2050. Um, and though the global population is still tends to be growing, the rate of growth has slowed. So here's another graph that is frequently shown when people talk about human population. Um, you can see it grow, grew very slowly um, until we started kind of really taking off there. However, if we zoom closer, um, the annual percent increase in the population has declined and is going is projected to continue to decline. So to control human population growth, um, growth rates of individual nations vary with their degree of industrialization and most of the current global population growth is concentrated in developing countries and human population growth rates can be controlled through things like family planning, um, voluntary contraception, and increased access to education for females. So we don't know how many humans the globe can support or how many humans the earth can support and um, growing human population size is a concern for conservation. Again, we don't know the carrying capacity of humans for the earth. Estimates for the carrying capacity have varied from 1 billion to 1 trillion individuals with an average estimate of 10 to 15 billion. We could be limited by food. We could be limited by space. We could be limited by non-renewable resources or build up of waste or even pathogens as we're kind of currently seeing. Um, the ecological footprint concept summarizes the amount of land and water area needed to sustain a person or a city or a nation, and it's one measure of how close we are to the carrying capacity on Earth. And countries vary greatly in their footprint size and also their available ecological capacity. If we look here on this graph, or it's not a graph, it's a figure, um, but on this figure you can see there's different colors that represent the per capita ecological footprint. Um, and you can see that not all nations use resources the same way, um, and we have a very large ecological footprint. This picture is from a different book, but it shows kind of the idea of sustainable development. Sustainable development would be development that meets the needs of people today without limiting the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And um, thinking about sustainable development helps eco ecologists um, establish long-term conservation priorities. Again, it's really important that um, any conservation effort takes into account the people who are going to be involved as well if you want it to be successful. To sustain ecosystem processes and slow the loss of biodiversity, connections need to be made between life sciences, social sciences, um, economics, and humanities. Uh, a lot of times I think biologists are good at pointing out the problem, but not necessarily helping to solve it. So it's important to discuss um, with people the human effect of things. 
So in this chapter, we talked about the levels of biodiversity, the threats to biodiversity, and the benefits of biodiversity. I think a lot of times people see the word biodiversity and automatically shut down. This is your diversity of life. So we talked about genetic diversity, um, ecosystem diversity, and landscape diversity. Um, our top threat was habitat loss and degradation, and then we gave numerous benefits, including agricultural, um, medicinal, um, and, you know, things have a right to live, those sorts of things. Um, we talked about different approaches to conservation, and then we talked a little bit about sustainability as well. So we made it. You made it to the end of your very last lecture. As always, feel free to reach out if you have questions.